Morning. I am Kathleen Thompson, Chair of the Professional Fiduciaries Bureau Advisory Committee. I am calling this meeting to order at 10.05. This meeting is being held on Wednesday, May 29th, oops, August 14th. 2019 at the Department of Consumer Affairs located at 1747 North Market Boulevard, Sacramento, California, 95834. This location is open to the public and accessible according to the American Disabilities Act standards. Item number two. At this time, I would like to ask Angela to call roll to establish a quorum. Good morning. So um, I'm going to go ahead and call the roll. Um, Hang Lee Jo is absent. Wendy Hatch. Present. James Moore. Present. King G. Present. Kathleen Thompson. Present. And with four members present, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Angela. Item number three. I would like to ask the committee members and bureau staff to introduce themselves. Can we start from my far right? <laughs> I'm Angela Quadra, the Program Analyst for the Bureau. Fred Chanyu, DCA Legal Affairs. Rebecca May, Bureau Chief. Kathleen Thompson, Supervising Court Investigator for Solano County Superior Court. Wendy Hatch, Private Fiduciary in the Los Angeles County. James Moore, Private Fiduciary in Sacramento County. King G, Committee Member and Advocate for Seniors in California. Thank you. Would any members of the public like to introduce themselves? Thank you. Item number four, Rebecca, please read the Bureau's mission statement. To protect consumers through licensing, education, and enforcement of the Professional Fiduciaries Act by promoting and upholding competency and ethical standards across the profession. Any public comment on item number seven? Good morning, Richard Calhoun with Cedar. I'm looking at the analysis of the fund condition. I'm looking at line number seven, I'm sorry, 412-7400, renewal fees. It's listed as $454,000. My understanding is the renewal fee is $700. You get there by multiplying 700 by 649, but the Bureau claims to have about 750, 760 licensees. Why are we 100 short without paying renewal fees? So in the first year, some of the licenses are issued for more than one year in the first year. And many of them are because there is a prorated to the second birth, the birth month of the second year. So. I believe, I just did statistics, I believe that we issued about 80 licenses, so that's um, possibly what it was. We also may have had some people that went delinquent during that time, so that's the explanation for that. The, where do they show? If you have 80 people that are paying more than $700, that would be more money. If you're saying they paid the previous year, the people that paid the pre previous year uh, this year would be showing up. It doesn't add up. There's money missing. I think there was another person that wanted to make a public comment. At the meeting in LA in January, there was an advocate down there who asked if perhaps the PFB should consider requesting additional funding to better handle investigations, better handle complaints, better respond to those matters that are of great concern to the public. And the answer came back, I think from Ms. May, that no, the budget is fine, uh, PFB doesn't need any additional money to do investigations, to handle uh, complaints, citations. It's just okay. 
But considering that the PFB has never in its entire history issued a single citation for abuse of a client, and at the last couple of meetings, the PFB can't even decide, define what would be considered a vi violation of a license. It seems that there may need to be some additional funding in this area, um, and certainly some additional expertise on what is appropriate behavior under a license? What does constitute a violation? What should require the PFB to issue a citation? So I think it might be appropriate to include those matters in budget discussions. Item number eight, I would like to invite the Department of Consumer Affairs Legislative Review Office to present the legislative update. Richard Calhoun with CEDAR. Regarding SB 303, what is this board doing to educate your licensees who have been using Social Security benefits and other benefits to pay themselves for the last umpteen years? It's against federal law. We had to come in and now pass SB 303 to put it in the California Probate Code. It wasn't in the Probate Code because it's been a violation of federal law. So you conservatives up and down the state are being violating federal law for the last decade and your board hasn't done anything to educate them from what I can tell. We can go back to AB 937 in 2013, the exact same thing. You never can isolate someone. Your, conservative, your licensees up and down the state were isolating them. We had to go in and specify in the probate code that control does not go to personal rights. In the mission statement, we hear that at every single meeting. Let's start educating your licensees on what they can and cannot do. They are completely out of control in this state. Linda Kincaid, also with Coalition for Elder and Disability Rights, and I should add that we were the sponsors of SB 303. Um, the synopsis here in the handout for SB 303 is pretty far afield from the actual text or intent of the bill. Um, as Mr. Calhoun stated, the original text of SB 303 was simply to protect federal benefit payments to the conservatives, such as Social Security. The case, the, the, the bill came out of a case in the East Bay where a licensed professional fiduciary was seizing a conservative's social security benefits to pay the conservatee, to pay the conservator, and to pay the conservator's attorney, rather than using those funds for the care of her client, the conservatee. Um, we approached Senator Wykowski, SB 303 was the result of that discussion. It was amended along the way to also include the personal residence. So the goal of this SB 303 is to protect the federal benefits and the personal residence from predation by conservators and attorneys. And I would like to read a few sentences from the legislative analysis that I think would be very enlightening. A conservatorship is the only profession that grants a service provider unfettered access to client access, assets. Conservators use client assets to fund litigation against the client and against the client's family. Multi-million dollar estates are depleted by legal fees while conservatives languish in substandard facilities. In 2006, the legislature passed the Omnibus Conservatorship and Guardianship Reform Act, a landmark package of bills to overhaul California's troubled conservatorship system. That legislative package was designed to remedy alarming deficiencies in California's conservatorship system that had resulted in abuses of California's elderly and most vulnerable. Unfortunately, the important new court oversights in AB 1363 were never funded and as a result are not mandated today. So I would like to ask the PFB what you can do as an entity to start protecting conservatives. The courts never got the funding that they needed. There are many parts of the probate code that are not implemented because the legislature has not funded those pieces of legislation. What can you as an entity that I hope has some interest in the welfare of the elderly and disabled, what can you do to start to provide some oversight and some protection for the people who are being abused and their estates plundered? Well, uh, we've said at previous meetings that we do not oversee the probate court and we cannot overturn court decisions or enforce court orders. Thank you. I would ask that you start overseeing your licensees. 
Item number nine, Rebecca, please present the Bureau updates. For complaints and discipline, um, same time frame, July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019, we initiated five cases with the Attorney General. We issued 14 citations. We have received 126 complaints. We have closed 74 complaints. We have 69 complaints pending and the average days to close complaints is 132. Uh, Kathleen Thompson on the uh, complaint statistics under complaints closed. Um, is it possible to get kind of a breakdown of how those cases were closed or were they completely, were they all closed because they were unfounded or? Well, we would close them once we either find that there is no wrongdoing or we're not unable to take action or there has been disciplinary or administrative action. Those would be closed as well. Would it be possible to get a breakdown? You know, 10 went to an administrative action and 64 didn't? Yeah, I think that's data we can, okay. we can um, supply at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Again, Wendy Hatch, following up on Kathleen's question to Rebecca. So if we take the AG cases and the citations, that's 19. And if the complaint closed for the fiscal year of 74, so there's 55 cases that, um, well, there still might be pending. In the, in, so some of this 55 might be in the 69, but of this 55, some of them were closed because of not finding any complaint. I'm sorry, can you repeat your <laughs> numbers? <Sorry. laughs> okay, if you take your AG cases initiated and citations mm -hmm. issued, mm -hmm. well, no, I guess we can just take the 14 because the citations issued are s cases that are completed and closed out, correct? So, well, some do become AG cases mm -hmm. after so, a citation has been. So in this fiscal year, the 60, the 60, if you take the 14 from the 74, the 60 cases, some of those 60 cases are still in the 69 pending, and some of them might be closed? Yes. Okay. Yes. And some may also be, you know, from the previous fiscal year that were still open. Okay. Linda Kincaid, Coalition for Elder and Disability Rights. Um, I have another complaint. And I know that you like to keep complaints secret, so I won't disclose the actual complaint, but I do have a cover letter that I'd like to read. It begins with, is killing a client a violation of the Professional Fiduciaries Bureau license? In past meetings, you stated that most complaints against licensed professional fiduciaries are complaints about care, but the PFB has never cited any licensee for any issues related to care. Your responses to our prior complaints established that the PFB is not considering the following actions to be violations against the license. False imprisonment, forced isolation, mental abuse, physical abuse, physical abuse, conspiracy to commit elder abuse, forgery, and fraud. Like the PFB, Florida's Office of Public and Professional Guardians receives many, many complaints about professional guardians. Like the PFB. OPPG failed to protect the public from predatory guardians. On August 9, 2019, ABC reported resignations of seven of 11 members of Florida's OPPG. And now I'm quoting from the article from ABC7. The majority of those resignations came after an I-team report in July about an embattled former professional guardian, Rebecca Fearley, who was under criminal investigation for accusations she caused the death of a man under her care by issuing a do not resuscitate order without permission. The California licensed professional fiduciary in the attached complaint went beyond allowing her client to die. The California licensee directly caused the death of her conservatee. Back to our initial question. Does the PFB consider killing a client to be a license of the fiduciary's license? And I will hand in this complaint. So as we've said previously, the Bureau is not a law enforcement agency and does not have the authority to conduct criminal investigations. If a complainant has evidence that a licensee has been convicted of one of the crimes um, you mentioned, please submit that evidence of conviction to the Bureau. If you believe a crime has occurred, you should 
contact law enforcement to submit those allegations. That would seem to imply that the PFB will allow such persons to continue with impunity for the years that it takes to work through the criminal justice system and get a conviction if indeed law enforcement actually responds. So we also, we don't have the authority to immediately remove a license merely upon the receipt of allegations of wrongdoing. If there's a conviction of a crime, please send us that information. Thank you. Thank you for confirming that you do nothing until there is a conviction and you let people operate who have done horrible things and unless they're convicted, it's all okay with you guys. Thank you for that confirmation. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Item number 10. Rebecca, please present the status of the Bureau's proposed rulemakings. Yes, at the last meeting, I asked if you could set an agenda item to discuss the mission statement and perhaps starting to implement that mission and perhaps even training your licensees on the mission statement. And I'd like to go back and read it again. To protect consumers through licensing, education, and enforcement of the Professional Fiduciaries Act by promoting and upholding competency and ethical standards across the profession. I will again ask that at some point, this competency and ethical standards be become a part of your mission of what you do, start training people on it, and start acting appropriately. Thank you. Richard Calhoun from CEDAR. Let's go back to November of 2018. There was a whole lot of requests for future agenda items. They still have not been agendized. In January, there was a whole bunch of requests for future agenda items. They haven't been agendized. The same for May, and now we have August. When do these future agenda items ever make it onto the agenda? The public has been asking for information about complaints. What is a complaint? How do we have to file it? I think I filed about a dozen complaints. I haven't had a single confirmation that you've had any of my complaints. There's a huge gap. The public doesn't know what's going on. You think you're transparent. We don't have a clue. We come to these meetings. We ask for future agenda items, and they don't happen. What is going on? All right. Any other comments from the panel here? No? No. Nope. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Storrs, the uh, president for the NorCal uh, uh, region for PFAC. And uh, in terms of education, you know, uh, I'm also the uh, chair for the uh, uh, Center for Fiduciary Development. So in terms of education and getting the word out, we have, uh, uh, we offer our uh, uh, resources uh, to aid the Bureau in helping get the word out. Thank you. Yeah. In years past, you used to hold satellite locations for your meetings so that members of the public were actually able to participate without coming to Sacramento. And that was certainly nice for people who live in Los Angeles or San Francisco and it's not convenient for them to spend a day, two days traveling to Sacramento to come and express their concerns here. Um, as soon as people started appearing in San Francisco and in LA and expressing concerns, complaining about issues, suddenly all of those uh, satellite locations were terminated. Now if anyone wants to submit any public comment, they have to take time out of their lives to come all the way to Sacramento to be here for this meeting. Are you ever going to start having other places throughout the state where the public can participate and make comments? We can certainly consider it. At present, we don't have any members from the Bay Area or from Los Angeles. So that's why we are having our meetings in Sacramento exclusively at the moment. All right, thank you. Item number 13, the <coughs> committee would like to briefly address public comment for items not on the agenda. The public comment for <coughs> items not on the agenda section is a time for the public to comment on items that are not listed on today's agenda. To allow the committee sufficient time to conduct its full <coughs> schedule of business, public comments will be limited to two minutes apiece. There are a few other rules that apply. First, California law prohibits committee members from discussing or commenting on any matter brought up during public comment for items not on the agenda. 
Also, committee members are not allowed to take action on any item not on the agenda. If you want the committee to discuss a topic not on the agenda, you may ask the committee to consider placing that issue on the agenda of a future meeting. However, the committee is not obligated to fulfill that request. If you have an application, complaint, or disciplinary charges pending before the Bureau, or if you are about to bring a complaint to the Bureau's attention, please do not discuss the details of your case or complaint. That's because the Bureau's counsel reviews disciplinary <coughs> cases and is not permitted to receive evidence or information that is not part of the administrative record in the case. The committee strongly asks that you also respect the privacy of others by not revealing the names and conditions of any individual involved in any case or complaint. In order to allow the committee sufficient time to conduct its full schedule of business, please do not duplicate or repeat the command comments of a previous speaker. At this time, are there any members of the public who wish to address the committee to, to or I'm sorry, committee or to offer an agenda item for a future meeting? I know that we already covered that. Your new rules completely hamstrung the public. I have submitted 12 complaints probably, and none of them got acknowledged. I was planning on talking about a complaint, but based on the new rules, I can't even do that. So here's a complaint, okay? See it? Documentation, I won't tell you the nature. It's an AG complaint that's already on file by somebody else, and it follows the same thing. It's also financial felony elder abuse. You guys need to wake up and pay attention because I could duplicate that for every single one of your licensees. All right. We're going to adjourn this meeting, and the time is 11.07. 11 Thank you.